So um, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I want to thank the program for also placing Nupur uh, in our lab this summer. We're really enjoying having her. And uh, it's great to have the energy from the students in this program to interact with. And I apologize, I have a pandemic puppy. Um, so I was asked to just tell you guys a little bit about me. Um, so I've been a professor now, full professor for roughly 10 years. So that means I've kind of maxed out on where I can be. So, um, and the way, the reason that I wanted to do this job is because I really like being able to follow my own creative nose and decide what I want to do. And what I wanted to do was just ask questions about biology. And I started out as an undergrad um, and all, you know, truth in advertising here, my dad was a professor. So I'm one of those academic privileged brats that got here because I understood what the lifestyle was like before I ever got started. And what I loved about growing up as an academic, the child of as an academic, wasn't like all the money because that was not one of the big perks, but it was really the ability to travel and live in other places and experience other um, communities and cultures. And that gave me a really broad view about the world. And it was something that I wanted to have in my own life. Um, biologically, I've always been interested in the nervous system and I was always interested in the chemical senses, taste and smell. And the reason that is, those mesh so nicely for me is that if one thinks about chemical senses from an evolutionary perspective, the way in which single cells first became multicellular organ organisms was that they had to be able to communicate with each other chemically. And this kind of preceded what we think evolutionarily is the formation of synapses in the brain. And so I've always liked that idea of how do the cells talk to each other to decide what they're gonna do. I like it in evolution. I like it in nervous system. I love it in development and I really love it in regenerative biology. So with that said, um, what I wanted to tell you about is the work that we've been doing for a while now um, on the development, or sorry, on the sense of taste. And here it's development, regeneration and dysfunction. And what I'm gonna try and do is go through some, kind of do this backwards and talk about dysfunction, regeneration, and maybe if we get there to development. Ah, okay. There we go, so taste. So I, the sense of taste is really appealing because it's very simple, but it's also something you can really relate to. So you use taste buds on the tongue to detect things that you want to eat and to detect things that you probably shouldn't eat um, that might be make you sick or actually be poisonous. And so these are examples of things that are high in umami or the deliciousness uh, as translated from the Japanese. And these, this is really the amino acid glutamate and it's high in seafoods like in tapas here and sushi and aged cheeses. And among one of my very favorites are the Baja fish tacos. So these are all things that I like to eat. And so um, as a consequence, even though these are a little high in salt, I, I eat a pretty healthy diet. So the thing that has come to everybody's attention with COVID is that one of the primary symptomologies is loss of taste and smell. And I think in the, um, in the lay world, there is a lot of confusion about what is taste and what is smell. So I thought I'd go through that here to um, clarify that so that in the end, what I'm really talking about is the sense of taste that is detected by taste buds on the tongue. So smell or olfaction is, again, really dramatically affected often by COVID and uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the olfactory epithelium is, this is where the olfactory sensory neurons have their um, cell uh, reside right up here 
way high up in the nose. And these send olfactory information about odors in this cavity to the brain. Now taste or gustation by contrast, as I've mentioned, there are taste buds on the front and the back of the tongue, and these detect sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and mommy. And these, these taste buds send their information by the cranial nerves back to the, um, the brain. Now, there's a third um, component of sensation in the mouth, and that comes from a nerve called the trigeminal. And the trigeminal, in terms of innervating the um, oral cavity relevant to the to flavor in the mouth, uh, provides information by, about spicy. So spicy is not a taste, it's a sensation of pain. And thermal sense, so, so cool of mint, or like again, the heat of capsaicin and hot chili peppers, as well as detection of texture, so somatic sensation. So all combined, the sense of taste, this sense of chemisthesis um, by the trigeminal. And then when you swallow, um, you force it odors back up the, the back of the throat into the olfactory, uh, the, the nasal cavity where olfactory neurons are detecting what we call retronasal odors. And all three of those combined give rise to this sense of flavor in the mouth. So that's what I'm talking about specifically. When I talk about when, when so when people just, sorry, didn't get the second cup of coffee quite yet, which is probably better for you guys because I talk more slowly that way. Um, so the thing with, um, COVID is people say, I lose my sense of smell, right? Or I've lost my sense of taste. Sometimes they mean this. Sometimes they mean, and this or taste buds. Sometimes they mean actually their chemesthetic sense is affected. But what I'm gonna be talking about primarily is the sense of taste on the tongue, which we use, as I mentioned, to recognize the five taste qualities primarily at, at this juncture. Sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. Now the sweet and bitter and umami are detected by a class of transmembrane proteins, G protein, G protein coupled transmembrane receptors that in the case of umami and sweet are transduced by heterodimers of the ta TAS1R family. So the taste receptor type one family here, and here are TAS1, R2, and 3, for example, that heterodimerize to detect the sweet in foods. Now, bitter is transduced by TAS2, R, so a bigger class of bitter receptors. There are about 30 of these in, in humans, and these detect a plethora of the different bitter compounds in the world that we've learned to ingest or still can detect and avoid. Now, sour has recently been shown to be due to the intracellular acidification by a protons that um, the protons or hydrogen atoms that are then depolarizing the cell by entering the, the cell through this OTOC1 channel. And then sodium is still salt, sodium salt is still, still the most kind of enigmatic and unclear. Uh, component of taste. And we think if there's an epithelial sodium transporter that, or channel, sorry, that is used to detect sodium, but the, the, the way in which this happens and the cell populations that are salt detectors are still a little enigmatic. So one thing you may have learned um, in fifth grade, and some of the people in this audience have heard me talk about this before, is that once upon a time, there was a misinterpretation of the literature from probably 100 years now, where it was then taught in grade school that you have these zones, unique zones in the tongue that detect these um, different kinds of taste qualities. And this turns out to be an entirely incorrect 
um, assumption or interpretation of a paper that was published in the very early 1900s. And really what, even though it's been taught in grade schools from for the last 100 years, 50 years, what we know is that there are different regions of the tongue have different sensitivities. So they're more or less sensitive to sweet versus bitter, but we don't have these stick strict zonation. So if this was something that you experienced in grade school, you can now, it now explains why, unlike what the teacher was hoping that you would be able to detect, you actually could taste all these different qualities in all the different regions of your tongue. Okay. So we use mice to study taste. And that's because as you'll see, there are a lot of things that we do with mice that simply aren't amenable um, to designing experiments in humans. And, but mice have a taste system that's very comparable to our own in its organization. So on the tongue, most taste buds are on the tongue in, in mice, just like as is the case for us. And there are these mushroom shaped or fungiform taste buds on the front of the tongue and in rodents. Each one of these bumps houses a single bud. In us, they can range from three to 12 taste buds for fungiform. In the back of the tongue are these deep trenched um, types of papillae, the foli and the circumvallate or CVP, which have walls, epithelial trenches that then have hundreds of taste buds lining those trenches. And these are innervated similarly to um, what we see in humans, where the front of the tongue is innervated by branches of the seventh cranial nerve, whereas the circumvallate and foliate are primarily innervated by branches of the ninth or the petrosal cranial nerve. And these all send their um, projections back into the hindbrain, where they synapse on that first brain neuron that will then convey that information up to conscious centers in cortex. So as I indicated in the circumvallates here, this is a mouse circumvallate and you can see these pretty taste buds lining the trenches and the top of the tongue is up here. And the arrows point to the taste pore where you can see better in this fungiform bud of a single, uh, a single fungiform bud. You can see the taste pore, this little hole, and these taste cells have long elongate processes that terminate in microvilli here that then have access to taste dense here through the taste pore. So regardless um, of their location, all taste buds, like skin, are constantly renewing. So that um, is kind of remarkable if you think about it. So it's one thing to imagine your skin turning over. You know, we all leave epithelials at crime scenes all the time. But, the, but taste is something that you think you'd be aware of that um, it's constantly turning over. But remarkably, what I'll explain to you is that this is a pretty complex little organ, each taste bud, yet the renewal and the ratios of renewal of the different cell types and their lifespans really um, is pretty seamless so that you don't ever experience a perturbation in your sense of taste. So the dogs are here. Okay. All right, all right, so within each bud, in rodents, there are about 60, 70 cells per bud on average, and they, come, are, they are categorized morphologically and uh, in terms of some molecular markers into types one, two, and three. Type one cells are glial-like, and we actually just call them that because we have very little idea of what their function is. They make up half the cells in each bud, the type two cells morphologically all express kind of a common GPCR transduction cascade, but depending on which receptor type they express, 
they detect sweet or umami or bitter. They're the next most common. The least common cells are the type three cells, which we know are those sour detectors. They're maybe sodium responsive, but they detect really aversive or really stuff that's so salty that you would want not to eat it. So we're, again, don't know quite where the, the appetitive or that the cell, the cells that like that are responsible for our ability to detect sodium that we enjoy. We're unclear about the, where those cells are. So what's interesting is the cells within each bud, they're rapidly renewed and their lifespan ranges from 10 to as long as 45 days. So, and we think these cells, the type two and three cells are longer lived than these cells. Okay. So how are these guys renewed? Well, just like in skin, we have these proliferating progenitors that in our hand, that in taste are cytokeratin expressing, they're hedgehog responsive, they um, express GLE-1 and patched one as hedgehog pathway target genes. And when these cells um, spin off a daughter that's destined to enter the bud, that cell exits the cell cycle, turns on a gene called sonic hedgehog. And then we've shown can that sonic hedgehog, which is post-mitotic, becomes one of these different cell types. And this is very nicely regulated so that these cell types um, are generated so that the ratios of different cell types with different lifespans are nicely maintained. Now, the other thing that these progenitors do as a population, and we suspect as single cells, is they can give rise also to these non-taste keratinocytes that express cytokeratins, other cytokeratins. And these, if you've ever burned your tongue, are rapidly renewing compared to taste cells. So you know that if you eat something hot, like literally it burns your tongue, that you'll feel a funny fuzzy feeling on your tongue for a day or two, and it resolves, unless you did a really good job burning your tongue, it resolves pretty quickly. So that's again, another job that these cells have to accommodate is to balance production of lots and lots of these rapidly with the right numbers and types of taste cells. So because of this, we actually, and hopefully many of you have not experienced this, um, uh, taste can be affected by a lot of different perturbations. We know that as humans age, the sense of taste becomes more blunted. And we know in mice that this appears to be because there are fewer taste buds, cells to fewer taste buds um, and there are fewer taste buds in humans. In mice, it appears that the stem population that's really renewing um, taste buds is not as effective as it was. Those, you can also get inflammation of the cranial nerves that innervate the front of the tongue that pass right by the middle, right through the middle ear. And that um, when you get an ear infection and that we think may perturb taste function. Targeted radiation for head and neck cancer, which although it's targeting tumors, that it's almost impossible to miss hitting taste tissue as, a, as, a, as an off, as an off target despite all the improvements in care. Um, and these patients suffer sometimes lifelong taste disturbance. And then something that my lab's been really interested in for the last couple of years increasingly is that there's a plethora of chemotherapeutics that are designed to treat all sorts of different um, cancers and actually pathways that are activated or, whoops, or inactivated in cancers. Um, can also give rise to taste dysfunction. But first, you know, I just wanted to also give you a little bit of an update about what we know about um, how COVID may be affecting taste. And so this is a, a there was a, a publication that came out early days from the Global Consortium for Chemocentry Research, which is a group of roughly a hundred uh, chemosensory researchers that devised and developed a questionnaire to send out in probably 20, 30, 40 different languages now around the world to see 
um, by self-reporting how people's chemical senses were affected. And their data came back pretty quickly that olfaction and taste and even chemisthesis were affected. So we, we got on the bandwagon with this with a bunch of our colleagues um, last summer because um, people had no idea what it, first of all, we knew so much less than we know now and we have so much more to learn. But at that time, no one could figure out why did, why were, why were patients losing their sense of taste or smell or chemesthetic sense. And so Eric Larson and I, um, along with a lot of these other people from all over the place, pulled together a review, just basically sending up some ideas of like, at the level of taste buds and olfactory epithelium, how might this, how might, how might taste and smell loss be uh, affected? So, um, and Eric is a, assistant professor in otolaryngology and a bioinformatics guy. So what we did was we went and looked at the minimal amounts of uh, published data on taste buds, single cell data, bulk seek data on taste buds, as well as on sensory neurons that innervate taste buds. And what we came up with were these hypothetical um, schematics. So here's a different view of taste buds, type one, two, and three cells. Oh, sorry. That was weird. Okay. Um, the sensory neurons that innervate them, the basal cells or the stem cells, and here are those sonic positive cells. And what we could glean from the data that were published was that ACE2, the SARS CoV, -CoV um, 2 receptor that allows the virus to infect the cells in humans, was most highly expressed in those non taste keratinocytes was lowly expressed in the type two and three cells. No one had looked at the sonic cells or the type one cells, um, but it was also low expressed in the, the basal cells, the stem population, giving us, there's, sorry about that, um, suggesting that there are lots of different ways that the taste system might be affected at the periphery. Importantly though, neither the chemesthetic um, sensing cells, the trigeminal neurons, nor the gustatory neurons were ACE2 positive. Okay, yeah, we're not gonna get through this whole thing. All right, so something that came out recently, I don't know, um, when did this come out? Yeah, in April was finally a publication suggesting that in human taste buds, that there may be a subset of cells, including the type two cells that might be expressing ACE2 as well as be effect, infected by the virus. So this is just an, a sample of the data from a bioarchives preprint that I've not seen um, come out anywhere. And this is a human taste bud. And here's the, these are the basal cells here and the non-taste cells around. And this is a marker of type two cells. And this is an, an in situ marker for ACE2 showing co-localization with some type two cells. Similarly, they did in situ hybridization for type two cells. So here again are the basal cells. And here's the non-taste and a taste bud. And then here's the SARS, um, SARS-CoV-2 um, spike protein. And this is a different SARS-CoV-2 gene inside a bud. And these were the data that suggest that it could be that there's a direct effect. Our SARS-CoV-2 may infect taste buds and in that way. Sorry, hey, uh, Linda, can I what? ask you a question? I was oh, trying no. to get um, this computer kit. Uh, so the ACE2 is really high in the uh, keratinocytes, but it looks like the infections in the type two cells, how do you uh, rectify that? Well, I, I, I'll just, <laughs> I'm not sure I believe these data quite yet. So good point, Joe. And so I just showed this as a way, so they cited our paper as a reason to like, look, they were right, which I don't think is necessarily the best way to do science, right? I think what you always should do is go, hmm, maybe they're not right and approach the question that way. 
But um, so I think this this um, this suggests quite a bit um, of work needs to be done. It's also important to realize how how high magnification this is. So here, for example, is a non-taste keratinocyte, which is I don't know why it's PLC beta two positive. I guess that's an adjacent bud. Remember, in humans, there's more than one taste bud in a fungiform papilla. So they really, I don't think, looked systematically across the tongue to see if there were regions of the tongue remote from taste buds that were also SARS-CoV-2 or um, ACE2 positive. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that, but it's not that important. Uh, I can't, but, but yeah. So, but the point is, this is really still wide open in terms of how taste is lost. And, you know, as we, as the pandemic ebbs, it's going to be harder to do this study in some ways. Um, but just because hopefully not so many people will um, be positive in showing symptomology that, um, investigators can then leverage. All right, any more questions? Okay, all right. Um, okay, so, okay. So the next thing then going back to uh, kind of what we've been doing, that was like a little digression just because I think um, it's a really interesting area of, that's what I was gonna say, for COVID, um, it's also possible that you could have inflammation induced by in non-taste epithelium that's being um, infected and that that secondary inflammation could cause a reduction in taste function just because we know that inflammation in mouse models leads to reduced taste function and also um, fewer taste buds. So that's another direction that, that, that the whole um, line of investigation could take. All right, so I already told you that taste can be affected by lots of different factors. And one of the things that we've been looking at primarily is, or have spent some time um, looking at, is the hedgehog pathway. So have you guys learned about the hedgehog pathway? Anybody? No? Okay, so hedgehog is a secreted pathway, a secreted, it's named for its secreted ligand, and in this case, sonic hedgehog. Um, and the way that hedgehog works is that it, um, in the absence of ligand, this transmembrane patched receptor inhibits this transmembrane protein smoothment. But, um, but when you activate the pathway by sonic binding of patched, then the inhibition on smoothened is relieved and there's a whole chain of events that lead to um, expression of hedgehog target genes, including patched in glee. So it turns out that activating mutations in this pathway, for example, loss of function of patched is very common uh, mutation in skin cancers among others. And so as, and it also turns out <laughs> that to inhibit this pathway, it's turned out that these, this smoothened is of what's called a very druggable target. And so there have been a large number of small molecules that have been designed that um, inhibit the action of smoothened. And so these small molecules are, have long been approved by um, the FDA to treat a lot of cancers, including basal cell carcinoma. But one of the things that we know is that um, lots of people experience taste dysfunction. In this study, it was 41%. Um, and that's a dysgousia, where it's taste is altered. And so this can also reduce appetite and lead to weight loss because you simply can't, don't like what you're eating. All right. So um, it doesn't it didn't surprise anyone who had been looking at um, hedgehog signaling in mice that 
it was entirely plausible that hedgehog signaling was going to regulate the turnover of case buds. So those are the, here's one of the postmitotic sonic precursor cells. And here are the cells that pay attention. These are GLI-1 like Z expressing cells that are turning on GLI-1 as a target gene of the hedgehog pathway. And so that prompts the model that hedgehog mate must be signaling outside of buds to do something that is going to regulate a process for these progenitors to produce more taste buds. And so that's actually not. And so our colleagues um, at University of Michigan published a paper where they actually used one of these drugs to perturb to, they gave mice this drug, and then what they showed is that taste buds disappeared, and that taste sensation, as according to nerve, by nerve reporting was also reduced. And so they suggested that just like the way that this pathway affects tumors, which is to knock down proliferation of tumors, these um, drugs caused, uh, they block proliferation of taste progenitor cells, and that's why you lose taste buds. And so we, i.e. David Castillo as a FAFA, former student in the lab, had kind of a different idea. Because at about the time when this paper was published, um, along with Kirsten Seidel and Ophir Klein at um, UCSF, we had published a paper that showed that actually Sonic did something really different in the tongue than it did in skin. So we used this genetic model, which was an inducible form of a Cre recombinase that is um, activated only when in the presence of tamoxifen, driven by the cytokeratin-14 promoter, which is expressed in all these basal progenitor cells in red, but not in taste buds. And so then we drove it turned on at top, we turned on expression of sonic hedgehog with a venous or green reporter. And we gave the mice tamoxifen and then harvested the tongues at a month later, roughly. And what we found as expected that the, the um, sonic hedgehog under this uh, driver system was expressed both outside and inside of taste buds because remember these K14 cells are the population that is the progenitor population for both taste and non-taste. But we also saw lots and lots of clones or patches of sonic expressing non-taste keratinocytes. But what we didn't see was a hyperproliferation, which is what we expected, because that's what happens in skin with this allele. Instead, what we found is that sonic overexpression actually drove differentiation of taste buds ectopically. So these expressed a general marker of, of uh, a general marker of uh, taste bud cytokeratin eight with sonic hedgehog, type one, type two, and type three cells all in red, in and amongst these clones of sonic expressing cells. So this caused us to say, actually, we don't think sonic's a mitogen like it is for, for tumors. We think it's a differentiation factor. And so in that context, then what we would posit is that if you give mice hedgehog antagonists or smoothened antagonists, you're not losing, it's not because the progenitors are failing to divide. It's because the cells are no longer getting the sonic signal to, the progenitors aren't getting the sonic signal to actually stop dividing and enter the bud and differentiate. <clears throat> so that's what I'm showing. These are the experiments David pursued. Um, next, which was he gave mice the hedgehog antagonist. This is a slightly different drug than our colleagues used. Um, and here's a typical fungiform papilla with cytokeratin 8 showing you all the different taste buds within one papilla. And then this is one that's degenerating. And this is typically what um, this is, yeah, this is a, a kind of a conical papilla with the remnant taste bud, and we call these atypical. And so you can see that the number of typical taste buds, just like what our colleague showed, was lost, was reduced, whereas the number of atypical taste buds was increased. 
So David wanted to see what this was due to and was this a, a result of a fewer cells entering buds to actually differentiate. So he used this trio of alleles, cytokeratin 5, again, marking the basal keratinocytes. I don't know how I go backwards, but somehow I've managed to figure that out. Um, and then another allele that in the presence of the drug doxycycline, this RTTA binds to this TET and turns on Cre recombinase. So it's a different way to make an inducible allele. And in this case, we turned on a YFP reporter. So we, David had to give the mice the drug twice a day for 21 days. And in the middle of that, he did a pulse of the drug to label new cells. Okay. And in controls, what we found was very similar to what we expected. Obviously, this vehicle can to what we see normally, which is we label lots of cells within buds here and some non-taste keratinocytes, although most of them, because of the chase period, remember they turn over very rapidly, are lost from the papilla. Now in the case of the um, antagonist, we saw something very different, far less lineage trace within the bud um, and comparable loss of lineage trace within the non-taste epithelium. And so in terms of, um, in general, the proportion of um, taste buds that were YFP positive in the presence of the drug versus control was much lower as well as, but more variable within the papilla. So this still doesn't rule out the possibility that the reason there are fewer cells entering the bud is because there's less proliferation. And so we assessed proliferation around taste buds, both at this longer time point, but also shortly after very short treatment, reasoning that um, if we treat the mice with the drug, we may miss proliferation effects at a later time point, but certainly within five days, when taste buds are still pretty normal looking, we would expect proliferation to be comparable to controls if it wasn't affected by the drug. So here's a vehicle. You can see lots of proliferating Ki67 cells. These are cells engaged in many phases of the cell cycle. And it's a general marker. And you can see in the presence of hedgehog antagonist, even with degenerating buds that or atypical buds, there's still plenty of proliferation in the zone around each bud. And so we don't see a difference in proliferation. Similarly, in the immediate term, we see, uh, we don't see a, um, a change in proliferation around taste buds, even again, in ones that are already undergoing this transformation to atypical. So, um, so what that means then, is that, which was really um, counter to um, what was the prevailing view of most chemotherapeutics is that in adult mice, so, so let me back up. So the prevalent view for any kind of chemotherapeutic drug is that if it affects the cancer a certain way, it's going to affect the off targets or the side effects because of the same fundamental mechanism. So the, preferent, the, the prevalent view is that anything that causes taste disruption is hitting the progenitors so they can't renew, right? It's hitting progenitor proliferation. But instead of acting as a mitotic drive, as it does in cancer, hedgehog is driving differentiation from GLE-1 progenitors. And so it's that inhibition of differentiation that's causing the taste system to be lost. So I'm going to pause there because I want to see if there are any questions about that before I go on. Okay. I know Joe, my reliable Joe is gone. So Santos is there. Okay. Newport. Any questions? Okay. All right. 
Okay, well, since you didn't ask questions, I'm gonna to have to tell you about more stuff. Um, so now I'm gonna hopefully switch gears and talk about um, a kind of a different project that will then loop back around to what we've been talking about or what I've been talking about. So in adults, Sonic Hedgehog promotes tasteful differentiation, all right? But what we've known for a long time is that during embryonic development, Sonic Hedgehog actually has the opposite effect. It is a negative regulator of the acquisition of taste fate. All right, so to tell you more about this story and kind of where it led us, first I wanna tell you a little bit about how taste buds develop in the tongue because ours develop very similarly to the way rodents, those of rodents. So I'm gonna focus for the, this part of the talk on the anterior tongue, the fungiform papillae. And in cartoon, in cartoon um, what you can see is that at embryonic day 11.5, gestation is about 19 days in mice. And so 11.5 is mid gestation and the animals look almost like little creatures by then, the embryos do. So the taste, the tongue is a bilayered epithelium of cuboidal cells and their nerves have invaded the um, tongue but not reached the epithelium. Now at a time of what we call placode specification, the cells that are destined to become the taste papillae become columnar, these basal cells. And then with a uh, Subsequent to that, we get morphogenesis. So a lot of proliferation and growth of the papilla and the inner innervation, the nerves have invaded or pierced the epithelium. And by embryonic day 18.5, we see the beginnings of the morphological cluster that is going to be a taste bud. And then full-blown differentiation is really quite readily detected in the very early postnatal days. <clears throat> and what we know is that hedgehog, sonic hedgehog, is expressed in um, these tastes in the tongue and plays an important role in the patterning of these taste placodes. So this is this is the the picture you can probably um, recognize the fungiform papillae easily by their expression of sonic hedgehog message. And here's the protein at E13 over here. And, um, but the expression starts out very broad throughout the epithelium. So this is an early embryonic lower jaw. Here are the lower incisors that also express hedgehog and hedgehog protein. And this, this broad expression in the epithelium gradually resolves to these really nice puncta. And what we know is that if you inhibit hedgehog signaling in, for example, under culture conditions here, you take an embryonic tongue out of a mouse and culture it in the presence of a hedgehog blocking antibody. And what you see is after three days, you get larger, more and more close together taste placodes that express sonic hedgehog. And we also showed that in, um, in vivo by knocking out sonic hedgehog, we could also see that there were more taste buds in panel B here. They were larger and so was the papilla. And that's just exemplified here. You can see in a control versus a mutant that the placodes and papillae get quite a bit bigger. All right, so, so this was an interesting observation all told. So we had known for some time that taste fate, right? If you inhibit sonic hedgehog, you expand the, the number of taste buds and the size of taste buds. If you do that in embryos, if you do the same experiment in adults, you actually lose, you induce ectopic taste buds. So it's a negative regulator in embryonic 
development and a positive regulator in adult development. So we wanted to know how and when this shift occurs, because what we thought was if we could figure out when Sonic becomes a promoter of taste fate, that we might be able to get some insight into how taste bud renewal is regulated. If we could understand when that process first started to happen. And so Erin Golden, when she was a postdoc in the lab, embarked on this study. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> what we know, so if you think back to the very, one of the earlier slides that I showed you, where there are these cytokeratin-14 positive cells outside of buds, and they make new T cells by turning on hedgehog, which then in turn differentiate. So we wanted to know when that process started in embryos. So we looked at that time of right around taste placode specification to first show that embryon, that Here's a sagittal view of the tongue. The tongue is facing um, this way. <clears throat> Sorry. And when you look at high magnification, you can see that these cells all express both keratin-14 and keratin-8. And then as the um, as taste placodes become specified, you get these columnar cells in this otherwise cuboidal epithelium here. You can see these guys maintain keratin-8 expression, but they start to lose keratin-14 expression. And the inverse pattern is shown by the basal keratinocytes outside that are re reducing expression in keratin-8. And that pattern is beautifully resolved by E16.5 here. So, but what we, so in order to ask if these keratin-8 cells are, sorry, are um, continuously being added to from the keratin-14 progenitors, we um, asked what the lineage trace looks like. So could we get lineage trace into buds um, from the keratin-14 population into the keratin-8 population? And we actually found that early on, because keratin-14 keratin-8 are co-expressed that we got extensive double labeling that peters out, but at later gestation. Uh -oh. Hello? No? Okay. Um, any questions? No? Um, at later time points, then we stop labeling. So implying that the contribution of keratin-14 cells to keratin-8 placodes was really just a process of this switch in expression and down regulation of keratin-14 and didn't um, um, suggest addition of new cells throughout embryonic development. And that was confirmed by just doing some 3D reconstructions of placodes throughout at, at different time points to show that the number of K8 positive cells in embryos at different stages and the volume didn't change. But instead, we started to see taste bud growth postnatally. So the number of keratin-8 cells per bud had a dramatic increase in that first postnatal week. And so that implies that renewal must be starting postnatally to get back to when this whole question of when does renewal start. And what we started to see also was that with both EDU so this is a birth dating effect, a birth dating technique where we can treat the pups with a DNA a thymidine analog that gets incorporated into the DNA of cells undergoing S phase at that time, birth giving them a birth date, and then we chase for a, a day or two here to see if new cells have been generated. If these in postnatally. And what we found was that P2, P9, and P16, we started to see an increase in new cells in buds. And that was further confirmed by the lineage trace into buds from the keratin-14 progenitors. All right. So taste cell renewal begins at birth. And so does this ability 
of sonic hedgehog to induce ectopic taste buds. So that means, and what that what we're showing, what I'm showing you here are jet. <clears throat> this is going to drive me. Not, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. Um, so what I'm doing here, or what I'm showing here, are um, that same genetic model where we overexpress sonic hedgehog in the progenitors, and we get patches of green cells, and some of which include ectopic taste buds. And you can see that in panels A and C. And in B and D, that's quantified to show you that we don't affect the endogenous taste buds, the same numbers are present, and, but we do increase ectopic taste buds in these uh, sonic expressing, um, overexpressing models. And these have all three taste cell types, types one, two, and three. Okay, all right. So we've identified the time. So this took a while. And now we can ask that question. It's like, okay, what are the molecular regulators? What's going on that causes Sonic to now at birth induce the formation of taste buds? And so we did bulk RNA sequencing um, quite some time ago now, but it took a while to collect all these mouse tongues in order to get sufficient um, uh, RNA to, for sequencing. And so what Aaron did was use, um, we knew that SOX2, which is a transcription factor that many of you are probably familiar with. It's pretty famous. It's a what's called a Yamanaka factor for inducing pluripotency, but it's expressed at high levels in taste buds and at lower levels around taste buds. And there's a SOX2 GFP allele or a mouse that has this allele. And that replicates the expression of SOX2. So SOX2, SOX2 GFP. So we leverage the fact that we could get a lot of SOX2 GFP cells out of the lingual epithelium. And we did facts and sorted these into high, presumably taste faded and low, less uh, non-taste faded. And then, um, sorted these and then looked at them informatically. And very nicely, at least with qPCR, we know that we had gotten the correct um, populations. The SOX2 bright cells were twice as bright as the dim and the negative cells um, were discarded. Um, and I don't wanna spend a lot of time on these data, but as expected, we saw a lot of um, sonic hedgehog pathway genes expressed in both populations. And then we saw many um, genes, including SOX2, that have been implicated to function transcription factors, the function downstream of hedgehog um, in other systems. And these were differentially uh, enriched in our different populations. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the suggestion here then was, well, it's possible then that sonic hedgehog, if these are differentially expressed in our different populations, we reason that if we ex overexpress hedgehog, we might see different expression of some of these transcription factors. And what we chose to focus on were FOXA1, FOXA2, because these were um, highest outside and inside of taste buds. Um, in our, in, by um, qPCR. All right, and so indeed, we repeated these experiments, um, or we did experiments using the sonic overexpressing model, again, where the green patches are these ectopically expressing hedgehog cells, and found induction of ectopic buds, but we also found that, for example, SOX2, um, if this is the green patch of YFP, we found that SOX2 and FOXA2 were increased in zones of the epithelium where hedgehog was overexpressed. And we also, um, and we also found that FOXA1 expression was potentially affected, but we couldn't really make it out in um, the immunose kinds of data. But I think what's really clear here is the PCR data, 
So we looked at the epithelium from control versus gain of function or sonic overexpressing mice and sonic was overexpressed as is glee as is SOX2, as we expected from what we'd seen in adults. And FOXA2 was dramatically increased and FOXA1 was decreased. Okay, so this is, we're still kind of counting marbles here and just looking at more genes that go up and down. But what, how do we build some kind of a coherent understanding of what Sonic Hedgehog is telling these, this epithelium to do in the context of taste renewal? And so what we decided to do was look for um, um, genes that were potentially regulated by SOX2, FOXA1, and FOXA2, presumably downstream of hedgehog signaling. And we ran it, we did these um, um, uh, gene target we, we looked again then at genes that were um, potential targets of FOXA1, A2, and SOX2 and found different combinations in this Venn diagram. The upshot was that really the only list of genes that gave us any kind of significant gene ontology terms when we looked at like the list of genes that they might, that they were potentially regulating, which would be these 103 right here, were changes in cell adhesion cell migration, cell motility, locomotion. And so that got us kind of excited. It's like, what if what Sonic is doing is um, telling cells to move into the taste bud? So saying to daughter cells, now you're ready to differentiate. What I'm gonna let you do is release adhesion to your neighbors and now adhere to your new taste bud home. And so we showed that in fact, that many of those genes that we thought would be functioning downstream of Sonic um, and therefore FOXA1 and A2 were changed in response to hedgehog expression. So several of these genes, including that were in those go gene lists associated with cell movement and cell adhesion. So RUNX1, FB4, and Fibulin2 were significantly increased. PLET1 um, also significantly increased and Potoplanin and CXCL trending upwards, whereas TGF beta signaling was reduced. Okay, so here's the last little, here's the last thing that I want to see if I can sell you on. And this is kind of the new, a new idea that we have and that we're gonna be moving forward to try and test. And so what we know um, is that taste buds, when Robin Dando looked with this uh, type of uh, systemic dye, is that taste buds have an exclusive look, signaling environment so that they can exclude this dye. That's, that's what this is showing. And why that's important is because the taste buds have to talk to one another and they have to have kind of exclusive access to those taste qualities coming in through the pore. The taste qualities don't just invade or like diffuse into your tongue. They have to be transduced and then the nerve fibers receive that information and take it to the brain. Okay, so what this implies then is this very static very tightly adherent taste bud compartment that's really important for signaling. But if you think about this from a regenerative biology perspective, the cells in here are constantly turning over. So how do they maintain this environment distinct from the extra, extra bud environment? And what we propose is that there's this kind of transient epithelial to mesenchymal transition for cells that are destined to go into the bud and they express glee and patch. And then they undergo a re-epithelialization to become more taste bud-like and then undergo differentiation. All right. And that this is all under the control of the supply of hedgehog from both the cells within the bud. And also we, I didn't have time to tell you this, but sensory neurons that innervate taste buds also supply the bud 
with um, Sonic Hedgehog. So I'm over just a slight bit, I'm sorry. Um, that is the model that we're working on. Um, just this is like very new and this is kind of I think where we're gonna try and go to try and be able to see if we can live image this process and see how this happens. And then understand the differences in, he in adhesion and locomotion that allow this barrier to be maintained but allow continual cell renewal. Okay, okay. Hedgehog signaling is important for taste renewal. It's a differentiation factor in adults. It represses taste fate in embryos. The chemotherapeutics that do one thing to block, they, they block um, hedgehog signaling in tumors, causes a decrease in tumor proliferation, but in the tongue, it blocks taste cell differentiation. Okay, and then we also have this new model that we're thinking about EMT and MET as a requirement that allows taste bud differentiation. And the thing that I really want to leave you with, um, if you remember nothing else, is that there's a lot of different ways to perturb the taste system so that people experience a sense of dysgeusia or agusia. And I think what's really um, important about that is that um, it gives us a lot of different angles to understand the very, the different processes that underlie taste bud cell renewal, but also the molecular regulators thereof. And so I think that the number of different kinds of drugs that are used to block cancers are going to have very different effects, um, will not have necessarily synonymous effects on taste cell renewal. And I, we hope that in the long term that this can help us develop or help others develop um, mitigating um, treatments for taste dysfunction in, in cancer patients. All right, this is the lab. We're funded right now. It's uh, Jen, Tina, Danny, Lauren, myself, and uh, Susan, Sushan Zhang and Trevor Eisner have recently joined as a, another new student and postdoc. We're funded by the NIDCD, the NCI. I wanna thank all our collaborators and colleagues and you for your attention. <laughs>